Hi there, and welcome to the Creative Endeavor Podcast. My name's Andrew, and this is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And I have really missed you. It's been ages since I've brought out an episode of the Creative Endeavor. I've had loads of emails and questions and comments coming through social media going, hey, Andrew, when are you going to bring out another episode? We missed the podcast. We're binge listening to all the other ones. So... I thought it was high time I brought you another episode and I'm going to do my best to bring these out as regularly as possible. So without further ado, let me introduce this week's guest. In this episode, I'm talking to Jess Anderson, who's an artist based in the United States. Now, I've been in touch with Jess over the last couple of years, I think, since I first met him here in the studio in New Zealand. He came all the way over to New Zealand to see this amazing country. While he was here, he visited me here in the South Island. Jess is an extraordinary guy and he's an incredible artist as well. I've never really met somebody with a heart as big as Jess's heart. And when you listen to this episode, you'll understand exactly what I mean. His approach to art and creativity and the way he uses creativity to reach other people and bring the best out of them It's just extraordinary to hear. He's a guy that went into maximum security prisons and was teaching inmates how to draw and paint. I was really intrigued by this. That's something that I would find really confronting, so challenging, I wouldn't even go there to begin with. But to hear that Jess not only did that, but he was able to get the best out of some of these guys in maximum security was just extraordinary to hear. And I wanted to hear not only about that experience, but his approach to art and creativity generally. There was a lot that I got out of this conversation. It really moved and inspired me. And when you hear Jess's story, I know you're gonna be moved and inspired as well. There's always something in these conversations, I find anyway, that I can take and apply to my own creative journey, that I can use to just leverage my own creative business a little more. It's a fresh approach, another angle on this whole thing that we call art and this walk that we call creativity. So without further ado, let's jump into this episode of The Creative Endeavor. Here's Jess Anderson. Well, Jess, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on The Creative Endeavor. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. Look, there's so many different things I want to ask you about. We've known each other for a little while now. You even came and saw me at my studio here in New Zealand. Yeah. Long way to travel for you. Um, but it's it's been awesome being in touch over the last, well, nearly over a year now uh, since we yeah. met. Um, so why don't we kick things off here? Why don't you tell us about how you first started your creative journey and when you first fell in love with art? You know, I can't remember when I didn't do art, and I've heard that exact phrase from so many artists. It's amazing how many of them that um, you're kind of born uh, with that desire. People tell me, they come in and say, well, you know, you're you're self-trained. That means you were just born an artist. That just infuriates me sometimes. (laughs) Uh, You're born with a lot of desire, but if you don't work your butt off, you're just a mediocre artist that has a lot of a lot of drive to go do little drawings and stuff, you know, but you never get good at your craft unless you really work at it. I mean, you have to work at it. And I can remember as a kid, uh, we were very, very poor. Uh, There was six kids and we lived in a house that I don't think was quite 700 square feet, six kids and mom and dad. So all six kids slept in the same bedroom, four boys in one bed and two girls in another little bed. And, uh, All the time that we were kids, I was drawing. Uh, My mother, my dad was sick in bed for, I don't know, 20 years. He was never, he could, I was the head of the family. So always worked all my life, you know, but um, I did art all my life. Mom would work at a butcher house. She'd bring home the little scraps of end end of the rolls, butcher paper, you know, and, and I would draw in every little corner of it. I mean, every little corner. I can remember as the first grade, we did things that they don't do now. I walked a full mile to school in the first grade, you know, and now they want to put you in jail if you don't meet your kid at the bus, a little different time. But even in first grade, if I didn't have at least a dozen or 15 of my paintings or my uh, drawings up on the wall, I thought I was a failure, you know, I just, so 
I drew all the way through school. Um, I had a high school teacher who really pushed me to do art. Uh, her name was Dorothy Long, and she always kind of took me under her wing. And, and even after I got out of high school, she, uh, she and I stayed in touch. And one of the things that was really kind of, it was really humbling, I guess you might say, I did a show over in Nampa, Idaho. That's where I was born and raised there. She came to the show. She saw all the stuff. And this was many years after I had graduated from high school, of course. And she got me on the side. She wanted to know what it would cost her to come in and take some classes from me. And to me, that was, that was the biggest compliment that she could have ever given me, you know. Um, she, she died later on a few years later, but every time I went there, I always took paintings with me to go over to her house and show her. So she was quite a big influence. I'm sure you had someone like that in your life as influence like that too. So, um, I, out of high school, six days out of high school, I joined the army and was sitting in Fort Ord, California. And from there I went to Alabama and then they sent me to Germany. I said I only went to two foreign countries. I went to Germany and Alabama, and uh, they were both real foreign to me. And in Al in Germany, they found out that I could do art, and so they had me take over a, a battalion training aids department, which was the art department for the army over there. So I worked um, ahead of that for a year and a half before I got out of the army. And at that time over there, I was. I was given art classes even to the other soldiers in my studio over there. So it was kind of kind of cool, but it was art, always art. I came back and I wanted to go to, to art school. And the only thing that they had around Idaho there was that Boise State University was there, which became Idaho State University later. Um, it, it was a junior college at the time. And I went in there and I said, I want to be a commercial artist. And so the first year, the only art class I could have was beginning drawing 101. And I said, that's not what I want to do. And then I had to go through history of Western civilization and math and, and all the other stuff. And I said, I went for three weeks. I only went long enough to meet Cheryl. Wow. And that's where you I met. Was, that's where we met. And I was... I was singing in a nightclub at nights. I had a guitar in the student union building playing Glen Campbell songs, you know, and <laughs> and uh, that really gets the chicks, you know. <laughs> so uh, it was a, a year later, we got married and uh, we were apart almost that whole year because the, there was no work in the area over there that paid right. more than $2 an hour. So I went to Seattle, I went to work in construction. I was working. 650 feet up in the air doing high-rise work. Wow. And I can remember even in there at lunchtime, um, I would get on top of the elevator that was taking us all the way to the top, and there's pictures on the inside of the, sh the sheetrock on the inside of the elevator shafts all the way up of my artwork where I was sitting there at lunchtime and draw cartoons and things on the inside of the, <laughs> of the elevator shafts, you know. <laughs> We got out of that. Um, we moved to Oregon because the, at the time, Boeing kind of handled all of the, uh, the economy up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And whenever it died down, everything died. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Portland. Or we went down to Portland and went to a friend's house. It was about, oh, it's 40 miles out of town. And they offered us a house to stay in there. They had a thousand acre ranch. And people were breaking into their house. They said, we'll let you have the house for nothing if you just watch it. So I was driving from there into Portland, going to construction, and I was looking up, trying to find a way to get back into school, and I found a, the advertising art school. Mm -hmm. So I quit my job and went to work in school, <laughs> something I hadn't done for a long time. Um, I ended up getting pretty well straight A's for two solid years. It was two years. I was a student body president. I was older than the others because I'd already had three years of army behind me and a, another year of construction and so on, you know. I got out of that and uh, I thought I was cutting a fat hog, you know, and and uh, I was offered jobs in a 
what they call Fred Meyer's Shopping Centers, which is, they're all over the whole west side of the United States. Now, they're big places. And one, they asked me to go to work in their advertising department. And I said, man, I'd like to do that. So I went in there and I brought my portfolio. I laid it down and he said, oh, I don't want to see that. I said, well, don't you want to know if I can draw? He said, oh, we'll have our, our professionals do that. He says, well, we want you to do paste up. And I said, man, I thought to myself, well, if I take this job, I can tell everybody I work for Fred Myers while I'm looking for another job. And I said, well, what does it pay? And he said, it pays $4.25 an hour. I said, mister, I wouldn't watch TV for $4.25 an hour. And so I just walked out, took my stuff and walked out. So I went to work for myself for 50 cents an hour. Right. And uh, it was in the back bedroom. Yeah. Cheryl was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met people who were in the CB radio. At the time, CB radios were real, real big. Mm -hmm. And he said they have a thing called a QSL card, which was a, like a postcard size. And, and in, in CB, they have these... Uh, handles that they use for their names like running bear and you know whatever that's the name they would go by on that and uh, the uh, guy says i wish i had a card and i said well why don't i draw one up for you so i drew that card he liked it so well one of his friends saw it said i'd like a card like that another one said i'd like a card like that i like a card like that it started a snowball going to a point, and we was working out of my back bedroom, it went on and on and on to the point whenever at the peak, I had six full-time artists working for me. We were printing 160,000 cards every 10 days, all in full color. Man. Um, we had, uh, wow. we, I had dealers in 26 different states taking, taking uh, uh, orders for me, all the provinces of Canada, Norway, Sweden, Holland, New Zealand, Bermuda, West Germany, Belgium, I mean, all over the place. They were coming in from all over the world. It got to the point, I took orders twice a year. I took them in December, and I took them in June. And that was all. And there was a lot of years where I sent $100,000 worth of business back every year because we couldn't do the work. And people had to pay me in advance, and they paid me in advance, and I never guaranteed anything before four months. Wow. That's how far behind we were. And we were fast. I mean, I was doing artwork so fast, all pen and ink. So we were let, doing... let me, sorry to cut you off, just so I can, can get a clear picture of this. So you're you're drawing these cards, and are people using these as, as greeting cards, like postcards, that sort of thing? Or just collectible what? art that's small, affordable, collectible art? Well, what it started off with, it's a, it's a card that people give to each other that has their name, address, their handle mm -hmm. um, that they were going by. And uh, they would give to people whenever other sea beers, whenever they would talk to them on the radio. Wow. And then oh, I, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Okay. But I numbered all of my cards. So I went by the handle of Run and Bear. And of course, Cheryl was Little White Dove, you know, after the song. Mm -hmm. And so the Run and Bear cards became, we were the biggest in the world for what we did. And I was getting calls from even like England doing interviews over the telephone for, um, they wanted to do an interview over this, over all these cards and stuff. And there was write-ups on that. Just here recently, there was a, a guy from LA who came in and he spent three days here with me at my house. This has only been a month or so ago and did a whole history thing. And I mean, he wrote a great big article about this that went out into a, another one of the, the medias, you know, that's on, on uh, the air. And I, it was it's kind of surprising to me that people were still remembering that kind of stuff, you know. Um, we went like that for lots and lots of years. And, and like I say, I had a lot of people that worked for me doing that. And we became more like a family than anything. And it got to the point where this poor kid was sitting with, uh, time I was 30 years old, I owned eight houses. I had a motor home. I had a boat. I had two cars. I had two kids. And it seemed like you didn't get enough stuff, you know? Everything was, wow. you needed more stuff. Yeah. And uh, it, it comes from not having anything, you know, from whenever you was younger to uh, 
it just seemed like you had to have more stuff. So yeah. I was doing a couple of businesses on the sides, uh, along with all the QSL cards. I was doing all kinds of business. I was doing work for for Pepsi and Seven Up and and uh, the Archway Cookie companies and and then all the businesses in town. I was doing all their work and I was I was doing everything. I started teaching for Chemeca Community College along with the art. And we was doing eight to 10 hours every day. And I was teaching in four cities at night, you know, um, on top of it all, making money on everything, of course. I was making more money than I ever thought I could ever made at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was off for a week and I came home and it is at a point where Cheryl and I never bumped heads. And we were starting to do a little head bumping. And so I said, let's put the kids in a car and the motor home and let's go take a trip for three or four days and just let everything cool off. So I we did that and we joined with some other friends over at Devil's Lake, which is a, oh, a place over here about 38 miles from my house. And uh, they had a bunch of kids and we had kids there. And so it, uh, everybody was playing and we looked all around and, and uh, Cheryl says, well, where's Jenny at? That was our little one. She was just about to turn three. And everybody would look, and I said, well, I just saw her just a few minutes ago, so we were looking and looking and looking. And then I heard Cheryl scream, and we went running out to the lake, and she had fallen in the lake. And she had floated up underneath this dock. And uh, she held her up, and I grabbed her, and I was giving her mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, running like hell to the, uh, to the car. And we were only about half a mile from, a, from the hospital. And I was working on her, working on her on the way. I was running into the hospital and I was screaming at the top of my voice and a nurse came in and got her and, and they put her into the emergency room and, and um, they said they had her going and they brought life flight in and uh, they took her into Portland. Now this is on one of the big holidays and there's only one road going over to the coast and back. Mm -hmm. And it was just filled with cars. And here we are in a 26 foot motor home trying to follow that life flight our, with our baby over there. Hmm. And uh, they kept her alive for 21 hours before she died. And oh, gosh, uh, yes. I'm so that sorry. was the hardest thing. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> to this day, that's the hardest thing that ever happened to me. I, I do everything. Uh, I've been an entertainer on stage. Um, I've done art. I've done construction, I've been a narcotics cop, I've done city councilman for city, I've, I just did everything. And when I couldn't save that girl, that was the hardest thing I ever faced in my entire life. And I, I at that point, I just had nothing left in me. And uh, I sent you a picture here uh, yeah. a few days ago of a headstone, I sit outside and I, I uh, took me two days to draw that headstone. Hardest artwork I ever did in my life. But when it was done, I never picked up a pencil for five years. Never. I didn't have nothing in here. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, Jess. Wow. Um, we, uh, for the next five years, we would watch the newspapers and the news and stuff. And whenever we would see a person uh, that had lost a child, we would drive to them. I don't care where they were, three weeks after they had lost their child. Because, and I told them all, in three weeks, you'll lose all of your friends. You'll lose all your people. Three weeks. Really? That's what happens. Because in three weeks, it didn't, it didn't affect their life. And they feel bad for you. They still love you but they don't know what to say to you and they all go away in three weeks. So we worked with 26 different families and every time we did, it opened our wounds back up too. Yeah. But I told them all, if you get to the point where you can't talk about that child and have warm things to think about that child, you quit healing that day. So after five years, I finally started getting some feel for doing some art again. And uh, I sat down one day and I took a big, I mean, I, man, it was 36 by 48. <laughs> and I, I started painting and I painted all day. I painted almost all night, a little bit of sleep, 
started painting again. I painted until I painted that entire painting. And actually, it felt so good. Wow. Um, mm. It just felt good. So that kind of put me back on the road to art again. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, within two weeks after she drowned, I sold my, my uh, office. I sold everything. I stopped the whole business. Um, and whenever that happened, whenever the runner bear died on there, the whole thing died all over the world. Yeah. It all just started down like this. And uh, they used to be jamborees out. Oh, I'm telling you something, Andrew. They, uh, they would have jamborees for those cards where we would be the guests of honor and we would show up in a, like a state fairgrounds here. There'd be 20,000 people in that fairgrounds. Cheryl and I would be an hour in our car signing autographs before we could get out of our car. I thought, man, if it's like this for us, can you imagine what it's like for somebody like Elvis, you know? <laughs> I, it had to be in hell because I got where I hated it, you know? Wow. They, yeah. you'd, go, you'd go to a, a dance at one of the things, and Cheryl and I'd be out there dancing, and everybody would be dancing up next to you saying, I got an idea for a card I want you to. I got an idea. <laughs> I, I, hey, would you do this here for me? Yeah. And I would wake up in the mornings, and there would be five motorhomes parked in my driveway in my yard, and I didn't even know who they were. Wow. You know, uh, uh, it just got way, way big. But after that, I uh, I only did art for myself and teaching for the community college. And then uh, I got a, a call from the prison, and they wanted to know if I'd be interested in teaching inmates. And I said, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that. Mm. Because it had been just a while be before that, some of my customers uh, in the QSL business had been guards down in Vacaville Prison, which is a real heavy, heavy duty prison. Right. Uh, people like Charles Manson and Ed Kemper and, you know, these kind of guys, big guys. And For so, real. For real. And so it was oh, one of those, like we're talking max security prison here. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. Wow, All the man. worst, the worst of the worst, that's where they went. Gee. So... I was going down there. They wanted to take me in and show me what is it like inside the prisons. And to me, that was fascinating. I'm, I'm in for an adventure all the time. I don't care what it is. I want to experience everything. I'm not the kind of guy who wants to sit in the audience. I want to be back behind the stage. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's going on, you know. So we went down and I gave a, a seminar down there to the inmates while I was there. And... Uh, it started something, and a lot of them started, I gave my address to them, there's a lot of them started writing to me. So in that prison, they um, they have an art show down there once a year where all the inmates that, are, that can put their art into one big show. And at that point, there was like seven different TV stations showed up, all kinds of radio stations, and there would be 10 or 15,000 people would show up. And all the art would be completely sold before the show was done. And so it was pretty prestigious for the inmates to have that happen. They had not just paintings, but jewelry makers, um, potters, uh, all kind of stuff like that. You know. So they asked me to twice, two years in a row, to go down and judge the show. And I was more than happy to do it. There would be between uh, four and 500 paintings in a show. And uh, I remember one time that really got to me in the heart was that whenever it was all done, they asked me if the inmates wanted to know if I would come in and give, tell, talk to them about why certain people won over others and what I liked about those paintings, what they could do better, you know, something like that. So I came in and one inmate came up to me and he said, you gave me a third. And he said, I really thought that my painting was better than the one that was second. He said, would you tell me why you picked that one over mine? And I said, I'd be happy to. So I set the two of them up and I said, your drawing was much better than his, but it, it looked unfinished. Um, you could have used a lot more color in it. I said, the other guy, all his color was done, 
but yours just wasn't quite finished. I said, you just needed more color. And he said, Mr. Anderson, I used every color I had. And I went, oh, I didn't think about that. And it was, so whenever we got back here, Cheryl and I bought three big sets this big of pastels and colored pencils and sent them all down there to the inmates and said, anybody in there that wants to use these can use them. So inside the prison also was different projects like the Blind Project where they would um, read books on tape. And any blind person in the world, it was the real, real tapes, the big ones, you know. And they were doing it at that one and seven, eight speed. So you can imagine. And person like Ed Kemper, who was very high profile, you can't believe how many people he murdered, you know. It was just that had the most incredible voice you've ever heard in your life. And he had five million feet of his tape with books. And they sit inside these little chambers and read. If they stumbled on one word, they had to back it up like you would on yours and start again. And I remember Ed Kemper used to pick Cheryl up and just swing her around and set her down, you know. Um, it, it, I was, we worked with him for almost a year before I realized that was the Ed Kemper. <laughs> Just, just but, to cut you off, I'm sorry to cut you off, Jess. I, I, first of all, I, I do just want to say I really appreciate how open you're being with me and, and how much you're sharing. It, it, it really does mean the world. I mean, you're a great guy with a big heart. I, 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 there are a few things that I want to want to un unpack here, and, and I'm so, again, I'm sorry to cut you off, but the thing that strikes me about what you're what you're saying here about um, Ed Kemper, for for example, is you know I I, I can't help but look at that through the lens of what we see happening today and this thing they call cancel culture. I mean, you you misspell the wrong word in a tweet and it accidentally becomes something racist that you didn't mean that way or whatever. They'll go after yeah. you and cancel you and everything you ever did and whatever. So here we have, like, just, just as a very in interesting juxtaposition here, we've got a mass murderer reading audiobooks <laughs> to people and yeah. and and sell it out so it's almost like having i i don't know it, it's it, to me it strikes it's almost like having hitler read you nursery rhymes you know <laughs> there's well, something you know, kind of kind of a yeah. bit macabre about that i don't know the, the only thing that you can say is that you know he would never get out there's no sure. possibility of him ever of course, getting out um but I don't know of a DJ in the world that has a better voice than Ed Kemper. Wow. Incredible, incredible voice. And he had to read anything that they asked him to. So it could be almost a children's book or it could be a science book. Mm -hmm. It could be anything you can imagine. And that's what he did. And I, if he had five million feet the last time I saw him, I can't imagine how many he ended up with. Wow. I mean, it had to have been a lot. But the only thing is, whether or not he wanted to do it or not, this is a big payback for society because those those books were constantly being checked out, mm. constantly. There was, they were going all over the world. They were going everywhere. And if people wanted to keep the tapes, all they had to do was pay for a blank tape. Right. And they could keep them. Let, let, let me ask you this then, Jess. How... Because there is something that comes up again, you know, this this thought in my head anyway, I'm sure a few people listening might be thinking the same thing. Um, the people that are in prison in particular, you know, like something like a maximum security prison, obviously did something to to be there to deserve that. I mean, and right. I know we don't right. I know we don't have a perfect justice system. Maybe some people in there are innocent. OK, so let's just put that to one side for a second. But there, there are people in there that absolutely deserve to be there, you know, murder, rape, whatever, you know, some probably some hideous crimes have been committed. How do you personally as a, as a person and as an artist and as a teacher reconcile between that because I, I you've been able to again you know you've got a huge heart mate and and you've been able and i don't say that to patronize it just because you're sitting here with me right now but how do you parse those two things wanting to help recognizing their humanity but at the same time understanding that these people have got a really checkered past so how do you come to them with compassion because I must admit, for myself, I would have enormous difficulty doing that. But here you are actually giving these people their humanity and helping them and, and talking to them. 
You know, there's so many of those people in there. <clears throat> well, let me let me put it this way. And I've said this for many, many years. I think all artists are about that far from the edge. They are. Because we, we walk on a different path than other people. We're taking more chances. We do we do things that people who aren't artists don't do. They're they're afraid. And the prison is just completely full of people who went over that line and got caught. There's a whole lot of them outside here that you might deal with every day that you don't know that are worse than the ones in there. But whenever I was working with those inmates, I never ever judged any of them. Well, there was one guy I did. He wanted in my class really bad and that was Charlie Manson. And he wanted in my class and I, I said, well, I went up to his cell with one of the guards there, and I, I said, I want to see the kind of art that you do, because Charlie had done a lot of art and music. And it was all this gore and stuff, and cut people with cut with knives and all this kind of stuff. And I said, Charlie, you ain't doing that stuff in my class. And he said, I'll do anything I want to do. He's about this tall, you know. And, and I said, you're not doing it in my class. What I told my classmates, you're going to do stuff in here. Your mom would be glad to hang on the wall. And he said, I'll tell you right now, I'll do anything I want. And I said, you're not in it. It's just that simple. And that's the only one that I judged. And I, I couldn't stand the guy when I was standing next to him. And I, he got too much notoriety as far as I'm concerned, you know. But I had, I had nobody in all the years I was in the prison system. And I was in prison there lots of times not as an inmate, of course, only as a teacher. Um, I never for one second, not one time, ever felt one bit of afraid. Never wow. one second. Yeah. And when I was doing the art shows down there, the guys who were on their best behavior that went into the art show with us um, were allowed to come out and help with their sales. Now, they're still inside the prison. So other people were allowed inside of that. It's like a visiting area type thing. And uh, my son learned how to walk between those guys' fingers. I mean, there was here's these great big guys and my son hanging onto a finger on each hand going down. And I can remember one time we, we couldn't find him. And we said, Tra where's Travis? And he, he couldn't walk yet. And I couldn't find him. We were looking all over the place and I could hear him. And I looked down this hall and I could see the back of this big inmate who was in there on murder. And I could hear Travis. And so I walked up on him and Travis is sitting on the other side of him with his legs facing him. And the two of them are rolling an orange between each other. And Travis is going ball, ball. And this inmate has just got tears just rolling down his face. Wow. You know, they're just people. And, and uh, I, I only looked at them as people. And and I still, to this day, only look at them as people. Right. Um, everybody has their own baggage as far as, I understand if somebody had something happen to someone in their family, that they're just so angry at those people. They want nothing but, they want them to be tortured every day. Prison is not easy. And doing the whole life in there is really not easy. Yeah. Um, but, I still, I made it a point that I did not judge them. Mm -hmm. And I told them all, I said, every time I start a new class or a new person, I'd say, okay, here's the deal. I didn't get you in here. I can't get you out of here. If you're coming to my class just to get out of doing a job in the prison that they put you on, I want you to just get up and get out of my class right now. If you want to learn art, I will teach you anything I know. I will make you an artist like you can't believe, you'll never believe what you're gonna be able to do after you come out of here. But number one rule, don't you ever treat me like staff and I'll never ever treat you like an inmate. Wow. And I and I did exactly that. And like at the, at the federal prison here, when I was teaching out there, uh, I did that and inmates are like this. They don't give you respect, you earn it, you know? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they was going like this. And we just started doing art and to get their attention, I painted the big tiger that you like so well. 
Um, I don't know. Maybe you can see behind me. Can you oh, see the yeah, top? Man, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, I mean, and I'll that... just I'll let the people know that are listening to the podcast that they can see this tiger painting um, on your Instagram, and I'll make sure I provide a link to your Instagram account there, and make sure people go and follow that. But that's yeah, it's that's, on my, ex it's my... that's extraordinary, yeah. man. I I, I just. Again, it's. I must admit, I'm I'm being so challenged here on so many levels. But but it's it's extraordinary because, I mean, look, coming at it from my particular you know Christian background, and, and there will be some other Christians listening. I know, um, you know, you always find yourself in these positions where you're constantly reminded about you know, Jesus and what Jesus would have done. And, and it gives way to that, that classic saying, what would Jesus do? You know, judge not, lest ye be judged, or let he who is not, you know, sin cast the first stone. And, and it really, what you're saying there is such a good reminder that we are all human beings. We all screw up. And yeah, sure, there's a lot of people walking around outside today, free as a bird, oh, yeah. who probably do belong in prison, you know? Um, there's a lot of, I know a lot of most, out there that's worse, worse. Than most people in government, government, most people in government, yeah. I think, <laughs> belong in there. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, uh, you know. Uh, so many of them, I knew their stories. I knew all yeah. their stories. You know, I knew everything about them, even though they didn't know I did. Um, in fact, when I was teaching at the prison here in uh, Oregon, uh, I was a cop at the time. I was a narcotics cop. I didn't tell any of them that. Wow, uh, wow. I was carrying a batch at the same time. You know, My wife was working. She was the manager of the district attorney's office. Oh, so wow, it was man. always kind of funny. They said, here, she says, here I am. Uh, putting people in jail and there's my husband teaching them after they get there. <laughs> so how do you, how do you go from, from these, the, uh, the uh, bigger pardon, QL codes, QSL codes, QSL, QSL mm -hmm. co uh, cards. Uh, how do you go from that into becoming a narcotics cop? Tell me about that. What, 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 what made you want to become a, become a police officer or, or, or an agent or a cop? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, uh, about, uh, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago after we uh, lost our daughter, we had a, we went to have dinner with a friend, an attorney here in town. And I came home and my house had been ransacked. In fact, the people were, they were here. And I, I chased them out the back. I had a nine millimeter in my hand and I would have killed them. I'm, I tell you right now. I was so angry that it's probably a good thing I didn't catch him at the time. Um, we ended up out of our pocket losing about $80,000 uh, with goods. Um, I, was, I was working uh, at the time selling gemstones to wholesale to the jewelers. And I lost 6,000 carats of gemstones alone in that robbery. Um, I'd been a coin collector for so many years, and I had rolls and rolls and rolls of brilliant uncirculated coins that never seen daylight from back in the 40s and 50s. And I lost 35 pounds of just brilliant uncirculated rolls of silver coins. Oh, wow. um, it was a lot. And so that I, I went down and got into reserves in the police here and I worked for a while here and then an opening came onto the narcotics team and I got onto that and I stayed on that for almost eight years and did lots of search warrants. But, okay, um, here it goes back again. I n was never mean to any of the people that I arrested. Arrested them, put them in jail. But, like, I took 30 people under my arm that were in drugs, big time. Drugs leads to everything. I mean, at least, you go into the prisons, you can figure 90% of the people in there, it all comes back to drugs someplace along the line. Mm -hmm. I took 30 of them under my wing and was taking them to their narcotics meetings, taking them to alcohol uh, anonymous meetings. Uh, I found jobs for them. I got them into apartments that they couldn't get into. And out of those 30, one of them stayed clean. One. Wow. At the end of a year, one person stayed clean. And she still to this day comes and throws her arms around me every time she sees me on the street and thanks me. So. I saved one person. What can I say? In the prison, I cannot tell you how many letters I got from parents who I have stacks of them here saying, you saved my son. You saved my son. You know, 
it makes you feel really good inside. When I was teaching in there, I really felt like it was exactly where I was supposed to be. There was nothing else I was supposed to be doing but that. Mm -hmm. And not only was I teaching them, I tried to mentor all of them. Mm -hmm. And our class got to the point, I was only allowed, um, I think there was 24 people in the class. That's all the bigger the room was. And uh, nobody could come in to the class unless somebody left. They either got paroled, they got stuck in the hole, they shipped them to a different prison, whatever. There was over 100 people on that list within the first month that I was there wanting to get into that class. And when those, a lot of those people got out, they all contacted me. I still work with some of them today. It's been lots of years. And I still work with them. There was three of them showing in galleries. There's two of them that are just absolutely incredible uh, uh, tattoo artists, wow. really doing good. Of all the people that I work with, I have not known one that's gone back in prison. Mm -hmm. Not one. And whenever you have an 82% recidivism rate, that's pretty remarkable. So you can't tell me that you can't reach these people in one way or another. Art was how I reached them. And I told them all the same thing. And I made them repeat it for me in my class. I got brutal about it. They loved it, though. I said, the first number one rule whenever you get out of here is you surround yourself with good people. Because if you go back and you get back with your friends and you start in the same circles, you're coming back. I'm going to be teaching you again. Mm -hmm. You surround yourself with good people. A year after one of the guys got out, I dropped in on him in Idaho. I knew where his family was. I dropped in on him. And he wasn't home. They had me wait. They just threw their arms around me. They just couldn't get me enough. They wanted me to take me to dinner and everything. He came in and came over, running over there and just threw his arms around me. And he said, you remember the number one rule? And I said, yeah. He said, surround yourself with good people. He said, when I came home, that machine of mine was plumb full of messages from all my old group. I never answered one of them. And he said, right now I'm the foreman of my job. Oh, man. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I still have a bunch of them today. One of them is one of the most incredible musicians you've ever seen in your life. He traveled with the Drifters and the Platters and Hank Ballard. He was Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. That's the guy who wrote the twist, by the way. Right. Uh, he was uh, he was his road manager for 26 years and his lead guitar player. Uh, he's played with everybody. You know, he's never even had a parking ticket since he got out. Awesome. But people are still judging him. And because of the group that he was involved with, they sometimes they'll they find out he's there and they march on a show with signs. He's been out for 35 years or so, it's not 40 years, and they still do that, even though he's never even had a parking ticket since he got out. Yeah. That's wrong. I don't care who you are. That's wrong. You know. How do you how do you suppose? Because what you've done, and I think a big well, a big reason why people aren't reoffending and going back inside is because they were shown some kindness and some humanity and, and some compassion and, and also showing that they have real value and showing something else through yeah. art that there is something else that's worthwhile to focus your attention on. Yeah. Do you think maybe, I mean, a bit of a loaded question, I suppose it's, it's obvious, but I mean, that's probably what's missing, isn't it? From, from what's going on today, the way it goes. I mean, because now a lot of the prisons and things in the United States in particular are all privatized. There's an incentive to keep people locked up. It's, it's almost yeah. like sometimes you, you, you wonder, do you really want to stop crime? Because you guys are making a lot of money out of it. You know, the federal, the federal prisons, they don't care if you get out at all because they get paid by the inmate. Yeah. You know, they, and uh, we had a warden came in here that completely killed the whole program. Um, Completely killed it. There was nothing. Uh, he would do raids on us and and take all of our paints away. You know, he would. He just he killed everything. Oh, uh, so that ended that. And which is really sad because I remember I remember I took their paintings out many times and put them in like county fairs and state fairs. I took them all myself. Drawings I built. I cut all the mats for them. Uh, I did all that. I I put frames on them if I could, uh, at least for the shows and stuff. You know. And uh, I would come back in with a little ribbon this big and have an inmate have tears rolling down his face because he got that little red ribbon. 
This kid had never had an accolade in his life. He'd never had anybody tell him he was worth anything. He'd never had anybody say, man, you did a good job. I made sure all those guys got told every day that they was doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Every day. You know, I walked in one day and there was, all the guys were in the classroom and there was this big skinhead guy. I mean, big guy. He has more tattoos, Andrew, than you got skin on your body. And <laughs> and he was in the middle of this whole group and they're all around. Well, you kind of got to keep watch on inmates. You can't, you know, they're a different society. Mm-hmm. And so I said, hey, you guys back up here. What's going to happen in here? They opened up and here's this great big guy. And he's got a lunar moth about that wide on his finger that had just hatched. You could tell it just had fresh wings on it. And they were all sitting there talking around each other, uh, how they would mix the colors to paint that lunar moth. That's so cool. Now, you know, and here's these big biker guys, you know, that, so I said, hey, listen, we're gonna have to put that thing, we've got to do something with him because we got to get work on our class. We only got so long. And one of the kids says, should we stick a pin in it and save it for later? And this big guy says, and kill it? He was so offended. I mean, he was ready to tear this guy a new one, you know. So I took it outside and I put it right on a tree. Outside, they could see it through the window. When I got back in, we all looked at it and a bird flew over and grabbed it just like that and flew off. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) And they all went, oh, no. You know, that's the thing. See, these guys would have never done that before. One kid told me, he says, I want to tell you something. I saw clouds today. I've never looked at a cloud in my life. Mm. He said, they were just incredible. Mm. Art does that. It opens up your heart to so many things. It does. You know, I I was teaching a a plein air workshop here in the South Island of New Zealand back in 2016. Uh, My friend Gina Roberts uh, will remember this. She was there. There was this guy who was walking down the, the footpath. We're, so we we're there. It's like a biking gravel bike trail. And we we're just on the other side on the lakefront painting the mountains. And I was explaining to people, you know, we're going to take a quinacridone magenta. We're going to mix it with the ultramarine, add a little bit of the white here and a bit of burnt umber to desaturate. We're going for a nice desaturated purple. Because if we look at those mountains, see how purple they are? As this guy's walking past, he overhears this. He looks at them. He's like, huh, they are purple. I didn't even know that. And it's like he yeah. saw it for the first time. And it's like, dude, you've been yeah. looking at mountains for years. You live here. It's like, yeah, look, they're purple. Hey, everybody, look, the mountains are purple. You know, it's, it was so cool. Because well, it gives amazing. you, a, you new, a new lens to see the world through, doesn't it? Yeah. Even my fishing partners and, and uh, just friends that travel with me, they say they love to go out with me because I'm constantly saying, man, look at how that shadow goes across that. You know, or yeah. look at look at that water. Look at how that look at that water. You know, they just never look at that water. Yeah. Water is what you put in a glass. You know, if you're going to have a drink, yeah. they don't look at things. Art opens up your whole soul, as far as I'm concerned. It's a it's a real opening thing. You uh, you have a different look on everything whenever you you know have art in your body, and I think a lot of that, a lot of people will never be great artists. They don't have to be. If they love what they're doing, you know, there's a, I, there's so many people that Bob Ross was their absolute hero, mm-hmm. you know? And what I, I give Bob so much accolades because he got people painting. He did. Who n- would have never painted. Yeah. And he got them, and, okay, today we're going to do a, look here, a happy little road, you know? And we would never say something like that. We would never do something like that. But for the he had his following, he was a he was a mountain, you know. <laughs> uh, Bob Ross is is one of those guys that will just live on, uh, you know. And, yeah. and and yeah, he he did. He gave people access. He and and showed them that they could do it too. And there was nothing yeah. confronting about it. There was nothing challenging about it. And a lot of people like to look down on it. But I'm like, listen, man, he he really paved the road for so many. Because our art is universal, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. People just have yeah. to have to do it, and we all are just looking for a, a permission or excuse to just do it. It doesn't matter, as you say. It doesn't mean we have to be great artists, but it it. it the, I think the most important thing is the doing, that we just get our brushes out and we just start doing. 
Well, in one of my classes in, in uh, Chemek at a community college, I had a, uh, I was teaching more advanced painting. So we were doing a lot of glazing and, and, you know, different things. It was way far past the beginning painting. And if somebody wanted in my class, they had to be a little further along so they understood what I was talking about. That was the whole thing. Uh, Cause you'd be talking way over somebody's head who was a beginner painter. And I had a little old lady come into me and she was, uh, I, I, I thought she was a little old lady. She was younger than I am now, but she was 67 years old at the time. And uh, she had taken care of an invalid husband for the last 15 years, something like that. She had looked after family. She had looked after everybody. And she, her name was Emma. And she said, it's time for Emma now. And so she came in. She said, I want you to teach me how to paint. She said, I've always done a little bit of drawing and stuff. And I said, well, would you bring me some of your work so I can see it? She was the sweetest gal. And so she brought him in and I looked at him and I went inside. I went, oh, my God, I can't do this. you know. <laughs> but I looked at her face and I could not say no to her. Mm -hmm. That that lady was the most studious student I ever had in my life. Wow. And if I would show her a technique, she would come back in the next week with six pieces of canvas where she used that technique on six different things. That's just the way she would do it. And I'm gonna tell you, whenever we got done, she, she took classes from me for 10 years. And there was stuff in there that museums would have taken. Her family wouldn't let one of those out of the family for anything. Incredible work. So you can't look at that shell and know what is a possibility inside. But she, it was the first chance she ever had to try, mm -hmm. you know. And that's the same thing with these inmates. This is the first chance most of these guys ever had to try. Almost all the inmates that I've had in there had zero art experience. Mm -hmm. Zero. Wow. And you, I sent you some pictures there, yeah. showed you some of the inmate art. Yeah. Some of that stuff is incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only because... You know, and, and then, OK, so I have other people that was telling me uh, we took them to the shows. They won all the ribbons at the county fairs, the state fairs, that kind of stuff. They won them all. So they said, well, we want to have a different category for inmate art so we don't have to compete. Oh, wow. They said they have all the time in the world. They can just do that. Believe me, in the prison, it ain't that way. They have just certain hours they're in. They can make a move every every hour. It takes they got 15 minutes to move. If they're caught outside in that middle time, they go to the hole. If they run out of white, they have to order it through their, I call it a PX, their store. Sometimes it'll take a month to get it in. What do you do without white? Not um, much, dude. You know, they're just, it's very hard for inmates in there. It's just that they tried harder and they had a really good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, listen, about your, um, you know, because I, I, I'm an art teacher as well, as you know, and and huh? I, uh, I, I love it, man. I'm addicted to painting. I, what I love is the little light bulb moments that go off for somebody when they realize what happens when you mix blue and yellow together or when they finally yeah. understand the relationships of complementary opposites when perspective that's eluded them for so long now they're nailing it and that really gets me going and, and comments like i haven't picked up my paintbrushes in 35 years i watched some of your videos and now i've gone to the store and i've got all some new gear and i'm i'm re getting i'm raring to go so that but, really doesn't it Oh. Yeah, doesn't it make you feel good? It's amazing, man. It's amazing. We, you know, we've talked, uh, you and I, a, a little bit about uh, teaching. Um, and and I, I'm i curious as to your philosophy. You know, uh, when, when you're taking a, a new student on, and, you know, we were talking about drawing, for instance. You know, how would you take somebody from the beginning in, in drawing and, and start well, to develop them as an artist? So why don't you tell us a little bit about your f teaching philosophy? Okay, whenever I, uh, okay, let's say I, I went into my class in with the inmates. And at first, I was the only one did any drawing. I sat down with them and I said, okay, I'm going to give you this picture right here. It was a real simple thing. It was a teddy bear. All these big old burly inmates each got a 
teddy bear picture laid in front of him. And I said, I want you to draw that teddy bear. And I didn't tell him nothing. You just sit and draw it. You've got 10 minutes. And I had one of the inmates, This I'll always, I always laugh about this because it was so funny. He said, he told me about six months later, he said, whenever you laid that down there, I looked at your back when you were walking away and I said, man, you are so gay. <laughs> oh, I, I just cracked up whenever he told me that. But then he said, and then that teddy bear just kicked my butt. So then I sat down there and I showed him how to do layout, you know, laying out. And so we did layout together. And then I had him draw it in 10 minutes. And their work was 100 times better than it was. Awesome. Just with that. So I made them all start from the absolute basics. And then uh, I got, and all the drawings, almost all the drawings that they did were drawings that I had done uh, in pen and ink or, or whatever, you know. And I would have them do these drawings, and I would give them homework whenever I wasn't there. Right. They had to draw. We we drew for six months before I allowed them to pick up a paintbrush. Right. Six months. Wow. No, and we, we went right on to learning the blending stumps, learning how light comes in, learns all the you know the texture, learning all this kind of stuff, using crosshatch, using you know the different things. Um, these guys got really good. Um, and some of the work was just fantastic. One guy, he was uh, he was from Mexico. He was born in Mexico, and one month later, his family brought him across the border. Mm -hmm. So he's not an American citizen. So he got into drugs big time over here, dealing drugs. He went. He spent ten years in the prison. One of the best artists I've ever run across in my life. Whenever he would do a pencil drawing, you would look at it. And I mean, I'm pretty critical. I can really see. It looked like a black and white photograph. Wow. It just was that good. And whenever he got out, they took him to the border and made him go back to Mexico. He'd never been to Mexico before, but he was born there for one month. He lived there. Mm -hmm. So they put him across the border and they told him, if you come back across the border and we catch you, it's automatic 10 years. Don't matter if you do a crime or not. If you come across the border, it's 10 years. Wow. So he got he got down into Ensenada, and he sent me a letter. Mm -hmm. I gave you my address and everybody left. He sent me a letter. He says, I can't get art equipment down here. He says, if I send you the money, would you buy the, all the stuff that I need and send it down to me down here? And I wrote back and I said, no, I won't do that. Because it's so crooked in the Mexican post office down there. If they shook it like this, that sounded interesting. They'd just take it home. I said, you'd be out the money and you wouldn't get the stuff. So what you have to do is go up to Tijuana, get somebody you know that can go across the border, have them go across and buy the stuff and bring it back across for you. So he did that. So I never heard from him again, but incredible artist, you know. Oh, wow. But he's another one that just started in the drawing classes. Yeah. So then after we got the drawing done, and I, I would take, uh, uh, when he was working from pictures, then I went from photographs, mm -hmm. made him work. From regular photographs, so we ask him play a different ball game, as you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was started taking in things like I took an army boot and a and a an apple and a some kind of a little toy or something, and I put them in there. They all sat around a circle, so every person had a different view of it. They had one hour to draw it. They had to all get up and change seats, draw it again from the different angle. Mm -hmm. So we did that a whole bunch of times. Then at the end of all of that. We spent one week on how to mix color, wow. full week. And we did all kind of things on our on our boards. We showed them how to mix them. How, okay, I said, now, if you had this right here, how would you mix that? And I would test them. And what I did is I took a piece of glass in there. I laid a color down on the underneath and laid the piece of glass on it. Said, now, mix the color and then spread it on top of the glass and see if it's the right color. You can look at it and see if it's too blue, if it's too red, if it's too warm, if it's too cool. It's what you can really see through that little thin glass that was on there. So they learned from doing that. At the end of that, then we started our paintings. Wow. Okay. All right. So it got. It was really. It wasn't a real easy way to get going, hmm. but these guys ate it up. I'm telling you, they ate it up. Yeah. 
But there's something were, that you're there's something that you're doing there where you're really focusing on the fundamentals first. I mean, the amount of people that just want to run straight into it and just start painting these complicated paintings and they can't even draw. Like you're starting at the beginning with teddy bears, and then building up the skills for that. But why teddy bears, Jess? Why why? Because teddy teddy bears are an easy shape. Okay. You know they're an easy shape. Mm -hmm. Teddy bears are. Easy to work layout on. I mean, it's it's easy to work their circles, your ovals, their thought. And almost all of these guys had kids. Mm -hmm. They got something now that they can draw for their kids. Awesome. See, there's a there's a there's a thing in there. There was it was all part of it. And they were getting where they made birthday cards themselves, you know, to send home to their kids. Oh, that's awesome. They made Mother's Day cards. They made I'm gonna tell you something. In Vacaville prison. Uh, about two weeks after, within two weeks after I lost my daughter, I had 40 homemade sympathy cards sent to me from inside of that rough, rough prison down there, all homemade. Wow. See, now these are the guys that everybody wants to point at and say, you should never help people like that. Yeah. Well, I did never do them wrong. There's a whole lot of them. I would never advocate for them to get out. No way. They should never get out. But while they're in there, why not do something good? Yeah. See, and that's that's the whole thing. Why not have them feel good about something that they're doing? Mm -hmm. Not gang boy out there on the street, the, you know, the, or on the, the big fields where there's these invisible lines that you better not cross that line because I'm a gang here and that's a gang over there and a gang over there. And there's gangs, all the gangs that you know outside, all the, all the, People that's on the, the, these bad groups, they're all in there too. Same thing. Wow. But whenever we got into art class, there was there was skinheads that sat next to black guys who got along beautifully, helped each other with art and everything. But the minute they walked out the door, they could not speak to each other in the prison. But in the in the classroom, there was no color, there was no race, there was no animosity whatsoever. None. Not one drop. Same thing in Folsom Prison. Whenever we went into Folsom Prison, uh, I mean, I, I spent a bunch of time talking to those guys in there, and they said, it is amazing. In here, there is no color. They said the same thing. That's a different prison completely. No color. But out there, can't can't do it. Can't, can't, can't talk. Can't be friends. But, it, but I did see one place where one guy was getting worked on. And the art class became like a, they were the, the people everybody looked up to mm -hmm. yeah. because they were doing such great things. You know, they were doing such good things. And so the, everybody, they kind of walked high on a cloud mm -hmm. and people looked up to them and they wanted to be like them. They started teaching some of the others because they couldn't get into the class. So they would teach the others themselves, which was really kind of cool. You know, That's awesome. um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a completely different thing. Um, I, I felt very, very proud of all the work that I did in there. I still do to this day. I, I feel very proud of that. So uh, if people want to think of that as being bad, I think that's their problem. I think that's that's their fault. Uh, sure. They got to look. They got to look past that. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I tell you, I, most of these kids, it was all from completely broken homes, gangs. No, didn't know their fathers. Uh, half of them didn't know their mothers or their fathers. Uh, it was just constant drugs coming in and out of their house. So, I mean, how do you do anything but get involved with that? Some people you know? just don't have a chance, do they? They really don't. No, they, they're they're they born don't. with a bum run of luck. And and that what what are you going to do if there's drugs in the house? You don't have a father around, or your mother's you know gone, and and or, or yeah. you, no parents at all. Maybe you're raised in a foster system. Maybe you, you know you've been abused or assaulted as a child. Like there there's some horror there that people go through as children that I think does end up playing out in later later in life. And um, you know it's. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. There was one man told me he had been in over twenty <clears throat> foster homes, and not one of them had given him a hug. Oh my goodness! They were doing it for the money, just oh. for the money. That's oh. all. Well, what what kid can be raised without having a hug? I mean, look here. I'm I'm going on seventy four years old, and I still got to have hugs. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But you know? now, of course, you got to socially distance, Jess. 
Oh, I know. <laughs> Oh, don't get me started. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring that in here. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the socially distancing gave me time to spend more time in my studio. You know, I, I went in. Oh, I gutted my studio that day. I built a studio that was 500 square feet. Right, right. And it used to be a swimming pool. And it's a concrete in-ground swimming pool. And it's underneath all the trees and everything. You know how many leaves fall in the swimming pool when it's underneath the trees and so on? So that concrete made the greatest foundation you've ever seen for a studio. Awesome. And it was the best thing I ever built. And I thought, man, 500 square feet, that's a big studio. No? I wish it was 1,500 square feet like yours. I wonder you know? how big this is. Like, yeah, I wonder, wonder what we got. Well, I bet, you got, I bet you got 2,000 there anyway. Well, I, 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 I kind of operate in, in meters. So what is this? This is going to be... Uh... This is going to be 11 by 14 meters, I think, all up. 11 by 14 meters. I can't math. Well, that's over 150 square meters. That's a lot. That's a, it's a See lot that? of space. That's yeah. a lot of space. It's and I, I still I, I got I got stuff everywhere. It's all it's all just spread out, man. It's sure a lot fuller than it was when I was there. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot going on. A lot of projects out <laughs> at the moment, and uh, lots more on the go. But you know, I, I'm here looking at you over Skype, and I can see in this one field of view, just the versatility uh, as an artist. You know, you're you're the guy, Jess, that uh, paints it all. You do portraits yeah. beautifully. You do wildlife. Yeah. You do seascapes. I'm seeing some floral stuff, uh, some quail, some bears, and and a lot of people that people can see this stuff on your Instagram. I, I want them to go and follow you and, and check it out. But it's also a mixture of styles. I mean, I see something that's surrealistic, something that's more kind of uh, graphic, and it's got this punchy style, and other things that are photorealistic. It's it's, it's so it's surreal, uh, photoreal. You know, it's amazing. Me, it's awesome. Yeah, let me let me show you something here. Okay, you see this series right here can you see all that yeah um, yeah awesome see, all that it's all western stuff okay um i i was in a gallery in santa fe big art gallery there and it was just the finest gallery and i i wanted to be in that gallery so bad mm -hmm. and so i sat down with the owner of the gallery who was a sculptor and i said um I would really like to show in your gallery. I'd like to sh you show you some of my work. And I had my iPad with me, so I showed him all the work. And uh, he says, man, I love your work, but I can't sell nothing but cowboys and Indians. And I said, well, he says, can you paint cowboys and Indians? And I said, I can paint anything. So he says, why don't you paint me a set of paintings and let's see what we can do. So I painted, I told him, I says, I'm in the middle of remodeling my house right now. And my wife has already told me that if I take on another project before her house is done, she's got this little plot down the pasture that she's going to bury me in and nobody will ever see me again. <laughs> and I, I said, so it's going to be at least a year before I can get back to you. And he said, that's just fine. So he said, you let me know in a year. Mm -hmm. So in a year, I had done all these paintings. Plus, I did it. There's been three more that I sold. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I got a hold of the gallery and kind of find out that he'd sold the gallery to another guy. Oh, wow. So I said, oh man, I told him the situation. He said, I'm always looking for new artists. He said, send them to me. So I emailed him down there to him. In 10 minutes, he, he uh, emailed back and said, I reject all of them. And I said, man, I really spent the time on these. I, I think these are pretty good. I, I don't understand. I called him on the phone. I said, why would you reject them? And he says, too realistic. He said, I don't go for realism. He said, I hate realism. He said, I want broad strokes and bright colors and I want thick paint. And and I said, I, I don't know how to paint like that. And I don't know any Western art that's like that. I said, everybody is pretty tight on that stuff. He's not, he says, you're not an artist. You're an illustrator. Oh, wow. Well, screw him. It kind of broke my bones for a little bit there, you know, but <sighs> And yeah. this stuff here, I really took the time on them. You know, I found a cowboy down in, in uh, Los Lunas that modeled for me, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I got Indian here that modeled for me. I, I really took my time. I got a new website, by the way. I just, just mm -hmm. put it open yesterday. Oh, that's so awesome, dude. It's jessanderson.com, and all these things are on that 
So if people want to go in there along with their Instagram, they can get on my yeah, my we'll website. Make sure, we'll make sure we link to, to all of that, Jess. No worries. Yeah. You know, that's isn't that interesting? I, I've had, you know, experiences like that with, with galleries. Uh, when I first started out, the the there was this one gallery that she said, Your 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 work is is drab and and boring. And and you need to really? you need oh yeah but at the time look at the time looking back now he was probably right uh, but it did something to me where you know yeah it, it hurt but then it was like well if that's how they feel I'm just gonna get so good so good they mm -hmm. can't ignore me and give you that was, drive it was oh yeah it, and by the way there's an excellent book that is titled so good they can't ignore you um i highly recommend that uh, but there was this uh, you know there was this period of years where i started just working on technique and then it was you know a, a while later several years and he got in touch via email said oh look i've been looking at your work really love your stuff forgot that he had rejected me and kicked me out of his gallery so i really love to take you on and show you what i let the email go unanswered didn't even get back to him didn't even have the courtesy to get back to him i was just like no screw you but yeah i, li I like it but you know what man uh, galleries can be a little bit like this but I, but at the same time it's a commercial enterprise they're trying to sell a product but i think now there's there's space for us to exist almost autonomously you know without an agent without a representative to be able to do what we we want to do and we'll find well, our audience some, by being authentic right yeah i had some bad experience with some galleries i don't go to i don't have any gallery i'm going to right now um I had one sell a painting, then they closed the gallery. I never did get paid for it. Oh. And then I found the guy that bought the painting years later, and he's just so proud of it still, but I never did get paid for it. Um, I had one that she called me. This was kind of broke the, the camel's back. He, she called me and she said, I've seen your work. I want, I want it. I, I've got a new gallery over here at the coast. She said, I'd like to have five or six of your paintings. So I took them over. She said, oh, man, these are great but you have to sign a contract in my gallery. I said, contract? I said, I've never heard of anybody signing a contract. I mean, we're giving you the paintings for nothing. You know, I mean, why would you have to sign a contract? You, you signed a contract to be in my gallery. So I said, well, I'm gonna read it first. So one of the things I read in there is that once she had my painting, she got it for a year, no matter what. I could not have it back for a year. Even if I had a buyer for it, it didn't matter. Couldn't get it back for at least a year. And then at the end of that year, if she didn't sell it and I took it back and I sold it within the next six months, I still had to give her 50%. <laughs> Get and I said, stuffed. <laughs> and I said, you mean to tell me that if you have one of my paintings and you can't sell it and I put it in a different gallery and they sell it and they keep 50%, I'm supposed to send you the other 50%? She says, if that's the way it works. And I scratched that out with my pen and I initialed it and I said, I ain't going for that. So I gave her the six paintings. She kept them for one year and never hung them on the wall. Oh, man. That... She's going to show me. Okay. Yep, she kept them for because I signed the deal and said that she could have them for a year. It never hung them on the wall, not one time. You know, oh, that's man. just. Come on, man. That really. This is it, people like this. I mean, I remember going into a meeting, right, where, where a guy told me that it was a 50 50 deal. And I just spent six months on this painting. And, uh, you know, they, they were kind of searching things out to see if I was interested in showing. And they, they came to me, but they said it's 50%. I, I was, remember at the time just kind of thinking, you're telling me that your effort and what you're bringing to the table is equal to the six months of blood, sweat, and tears, the years of, of study that I've done, how much, like the yep. experience of being out in the landscape, going to these places, you know, the expense and the materials, all of that, everything I put in to create this work of art, and you're telling me that what you bring to the table is worth half of that, uh-uh. You know, and, and I don't care that you gotta pay the rent on this place or hire whoever to sit at the front desk, or, or, you know, to, to answer the phone and whatnot, or the, the invites you have to say, you know, you make a couple of calls or whatever. 
I just, I just don't get it, Jess. The, the business model doesn't make sense to me. I got an agent right now who, who I'm working with in Western Australia, and he helps me handle the market that I had already established through my old agent in Perth in Western Australia. And this guy, Andreas is his name. He's great. He's a great dude. Uh, I've got all the time in the world for him, and, and I really trust him. And, I, and now my, my business relationships with representatives are always built on trust. I don't have a contract with them. We mm. talk, we, we come up with a deal, and we trust each other. That's it. That's because, see, that's because you have the thing that I, I pride myself in having, and you have it not too many people have, it's called integrity. And your friend there has integrity. See, yeah. whenever you have integrity, you don't need a contract. Lawyers won't tell you that. They they say no way. I don't care who, what kind of integrity. They're going to screw you sooner, sooner or later. You know, uh, I don't know. They, I walked into one gallery. I'd worked for oh I don't know, but I paint pretty fast, and it, I painted a painting that was it was uh, six foot by eight foot, and it was a bridge and all this reflection in the water. You can see all the way to the bottom of it and all the different things and leaves floating on the top and. And I worked for, I don't know, it was probably a month on that. And this has been about 25 years ago. I took it into the gallery and I leaned it against the wall and she says, okay, how much are you going to want for that? She says, she told me, she said, how about 3000 I thought, well, okay, we'll go 3000 They wanted half of it. So I leaned it against the wall. She says, I'll hang it up tonight. And I said, good, I'll come back in tomorrow. I want to see what it looks like. So I came back in the next day, and it wasn't on the wall. And she said, oh, well, a guy walked in. As you walked out, he walked in. He paid me cash for it. It's on its way to San Diego. That's how long she worked for that 1500 bucks. <laughs> you know, I, and, you know, everybody says, well, it wouldn't have sold if she hadn't been in her gallery, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there is that, I guess. Yeah. You know, there's, there's that, you know. But it was kind of hard to swallow because here I'd work every day, you know, for a month on that thing. <laughs> I, I think it's but, really I think it's really important. I mean, it, we, we need as artists, we need to to really work on these value for value relationships. It, it needs to be equal value on both sides. You know, in talking to, to Cesar Santos, for instance, on, on the podcast, I mean, he's a big advocate for galleries and and agents and dealers in, in terms of, you know, he would even go out of his way, offer him more money because he knows he's going to get more exposure above and beyond other artists that are shown in that gallery. So he, he's gotten really business minded about it and he's happy to pay the, the 50%. I hope I'm not misspeaking. Um, but uh, from memory, when we did our podcast, a couple of podcasts together, uh, I, I seem to recall him, him talking about it in those terms. And I was like, huh, you know, he, he kind of got me to revisit the idea a little bit. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to what are you willing to, to, to work with? What is your mm -hmm. level? That's different for everybody. Uh, and, and how much do you value them? And how much does a gallery value you? Can you come to some sort of agreement and really, you know, shake hands on it? If you need a contract, go for a contract. If you don't, perfect. I, I prefer not to have one, but... No. See, I don't know of a gallery here. I don't know of a gallery any place that will do anything less than fifty percent. I don't know any of them. Well, maybe down under. Lot. Maybe down under, man. I mean, because down here, you know, it's a lot more reasonable uh, that I found as well. And and also the other thing as well is is. You know, I, I found as as I stopped being so afraid to walk away just to tell people no. You know, I was I was so afraid for the longest time to just say no. I'm not doing that. No. You know, no, no, I'm yeah. too, no, I'm too busy. And, and, and now it's gotten to the point because running online business, right. You know, with, with the YouTube video, the, the selling the, the tutorials and stuff, I'm like, well, I don't, I don't want to get rid of the painting. I don't want to sell the painting. I'm selling the, the tutorial. I like the painting. I'm going to hang it up. And, and on well, the other, I, other side of this wall, I got my own damn gallery. What do I need yours for? <laughs> that's right. Oh man. I'd hang one of your paintings in my house in a heartbeat. Oh, no worries, man. I'll do you a deal. <laughs> such a deal i wouldn't give my brother such a deal right <laughs> but you know it's it's interesting we're, we're moving into an interesting time aren't we where where the the marketplace and the world is shifting and we're seeing 
galleries closed down left, right, and center. And when they're not closed down, they have to operate under such draconian restrictions to their business. You know, you got to take people's names and numbers. I mean, come on, man. You know, they walk in, sanitize your hand before you, you, you look at the artwork. I closed my gallery down. I'm about to put a sign in the window that says gallery closed until further notice due to government tyranny. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm so sick of this, man. I think the galleries are really going to suffer a huge loss here. Uh, as artists, Jess, what do you see? What, what do you think our options are moving forward? Well, right now we see all kinds of uh, galleries closing here, too. And even the ones that, that um, aren't closed are not doing very much business. Um, the problem, there's a real problem in the fact that the new generation doesn't buy paintings. Right. The new generation don't care. I mean, they'll print something off on their computer, put on the wall. Mm. They don't care about art. Um, I talked, my son is in Microsoft, you know, and I, I, he, all of his friends are computer guys, you know, and mm -hmm. they don't buy paintings. None of them. They don't buy any paintings. They don't, it just doesn't mean anything to them. It's not worth the money to them. Um, there's what we're seeing so much of around here is now artist co-ops where uh, they'll get a building and maybe 20 artists will each have a portion of the building and then they'll have they have to take turns running the building one day a month or two days a month. Uh, and and they don't have such a big they don't do 50 percent. I think they were doing 30 percent. if I remember right. Mm -hmm. that they had to give to the take care of the lights and water and building and stuff, you know. Um, but still, even those, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of paintings being sold. Right, right. Uh, the older people are, are getting rid of everything. You know, they're sizing down. Um, and the younger people don't care about art. But you know it's, what I'm finding, though? I mean, it's, it's interesting hearing you say that. I'm finding that, you know, when I look at my analytics on my videos and, and also just the sales records, I've got an enormous amount of young people between, you know, huge demographic between 20 and 30 of young, you know, really? people that want to learn how to paint. You know, so maybe mm -hmm. it's not necessarily buying work, but they certainly want to do it. Well, you are an awesome teacher. I mean, you really are. Uh, my hat is off to you. I think you are the, the best thing going out there right now. I really do. Oh, stop, um, dude. Come on. Uh, no, I, Check, checks any, in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I look at everything you do. You are uh, somebody I really look up to. I painted for, I got my first set of oils when I was 11, and I'm getting ready to turn 74 on my next one. So, that's painting a long time, and uh, I, I have to say that I I look up to your art uh, more than about anybody out there right now. Oh, I've got a few people that I really, really, really love to look at their work. Mm. Um, Carl Brenders is one of those guys. I don't oh, know if you know him. Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Wildlife, yeah, amazing, amazing. I met I met Carl, and he critiqued the, some of the paintings I had, you know, and and wonderful guy. In fact, he invited me to Belgium to paint in his gallery. They're painting his studio. Now, whether or not he meant it or not, that meant a lot to me. Wow. You know, that meant a lot to me. Um, there's just people like that that I really look up to. Um, as far as wildlife art, uh, Robert Bateman made more in, more impact on anybody, I think, than about anyone. You know, I mean. And Absolutely. He's, he's still painting and he's still down to earth. You know, that's the thing. It's nice. So I, I think it's really important for all of us artists to meet each other. Mm -hmm. And um, after your podcast, I introduced myself to Tom Fluharty and hell, we talk all the time, you know, and we oh, Skype a, each other. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a great I sent guy. Him, I sent him one of my prints. He sent me one of his books, you know, I mean, we, you know, we get along great, you know, yeah, I, yeah. and I think it, that, that's wonderful. It drives me mm. when I meet these guys, you know, yeah. um, uh, I, I look at their work, and if I really like it, I contact them. Yeah. If they want to talk to me, awesome. If they don't, hey, I'm not out anything. At least I tried. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> 
I remember, I remember it was first meeting you as well when you came, like, because we were talking on email, and and my wife um, Rachel uh, helps me organize the business side of things, so she's checking the emails, and she's like, "There's this guy, um, Jesse Anderson, who's who's emailed you, and he sent some pictures of his work. It's pretty good. You need to take a look at it." And I'm like, oh, "Okay," I looked at it. I was like holy mackerel like that tiger portrait alone i was like wow and then you come to meet me at the studio here in new zealand uh, you come to meet a vegan artist wearing bacon is my spirit animal t-shirt <laughs> good move buddy <laughs> yeah bacon is my spirit animal yeah and you know that was our uh, the reason we came over there that was cheryl and i's 50th anniversary yeah uh, and uh you know we're still going strong in fact in about three days, we have our 51st. So, oh, amazing. you know, that's uh, that's great. The thing is so awesome about our, we are a team, you know, yeah. artists have to have a team. Yeah. Artists are not good bookkeepers. No, no. no. Artists don't keep track of stuff. No, no, they don't. And they need that other part. And I would be absolutely lost without her. I'm, t I'm serious. I would be lost without her. Mm. She uh, keeps track of all of that. And she's always told everybody, He's the talent. I'm the brains. And you know something? I'm not going to argue with her. No, I, I say this all the time about Rachel as well. You know, I have to force myself to not be such a flake. And I'm a flake at the best of times. Like, man, I am just, I, I you know, keeping a schedule, keeping time, time management and all that. Because there's so many things going on. There's so much I want to do. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so just having somebody to just kind of, keep track of you keep your feet on the ground it's it's important and we were lucky we're lucky you and i aren't we that we have our yeah. our, our very, better better halves to to keep us on track yeah very very lucky and she doesn't uh do artwork oh my god she's my worst critic right and she comes in she don't <laughs> hold any bones about it either she comes in and says that's wrong yeah oh man you know none some, of this baby up no no it's some days i i i have to tell rachel listen I'm, I'm not feeling great i'm feeling a little bit down about this painting go easy on me because i know i'm gonna get it i know that she's gonna tell me exactly what she's thinking but sometimes you need that right because you, you need somebody who's not gonna butter you up and is gonna tell you exactly the way your painting is or you know yeah sometimes it really ticks me off i mean sometimes it really does yeah. and i tell her get out of my studio <laughs> But then I then I look at it and I look at it and I look at it and I say, well, maybe, maybe I can change some of that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I tell her you were manager for so many years in that DA's office and you just can't get over being manager, can you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know what to do without her. Yeah. Don't know. She's the one that's been doing most of the work on the new website right now. So awesome. Uh, I sit and wrote all the little stories and did all that stuff for each of the paintings and and so on. I did all that, sized them and and priced them and so on. But she put it all together. So, hey, kudos because I tell you, I'm a I'm deficient when it comes to computers. Right. Okay. I know how to run my email and a few things like that. You know. And, yeah. 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 It's. But, it's a new, it's a, it is a new world. I mean, I, and again, uh, forgive me, I don't mean to age you here, but, uh, but a, a lot of, a lot of people from your generation, it's, it's, it's a paradigm shift. You know, I'm talking to dad now on Skype, which is, which is incredible. I never think I'd get him on Skype and, and, yeah. and I, I, I email with him back and forth and, uh, I still, he still have not gotten, he, he hasn't bought a cell phone, but that's probably a good thing. Um, you know, but it, it it's, it's a paradigm shift. What excites me, though, about this new technology, you know, websites, social media, YouTube, all of these different platforms that we have is now, I think, you know, and we were talking about galleries earlier. Now I think it's, it's really given us artists access. We have access not only to each other, to start building yeah. a network, building a team. Because, you know, it's interesting. I, I really do feel I've got people that I've actually never met in person but that are part of my team that mm -hmm. I get to uh, hang out with now and again on a Skype call or message back and forth on Instagram that, that I feel really close to and, mm -hmm. and, you know, great people. I, when, when would that have been possible? And also, you know, by the same measure, I can, I can reach out there and find clients to buy either work or tutorials or whatever. And, and now, I feel like we have really been put in the driver's seat, whereas before 
you didn't have the choice. There was always a middleman. You wanted to yeah. sell your work, go to a gallery. That's always how it's worked. Yeah, I, I go back as far as uh, I can remember whenever the first calculator came out. Oh, wow. Texas Instruments, they called it. Yeah, right. It was about that big and about that wide. And if you got caught with one of those at school, they expelled you because that was cheating. Wow. And now a kid can't get into kindergarten without a computer. Yeah. You know, going, what? What happened in this in this time? There's been so much change in my lifetime. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, in my day, as far as meeting other artists, where? I mean, where would you meet other artists? Um, maybe you take a class at a community college, but there was no great artists there. They were everybody just like you. So I, I've always said, if you want to be the best golfer in town, you go play golf with the best golfer in town. You know, and the same thing goes with art. If you, the classroom is so much better than anything else, or painting with somebody that's much better than you, it makes you try harder. Oh, yeah. You know, and you pick up, I don't care how old you get. I learn something new on every painting. Mm. I mean, everything. If you get where you think, man, I know it all, you're going down. You're going back down because you don't know it all. There's always something you don't know. It, and it, I, yeah, art's, art's one of those really weird, humbling things, isn't it? Because our human limitations are, are right at the forefront when we start to paint and draw. It's, you suddenly yep. realize, man, I don't understand anything. You know, yeah. and you're always a student when you've got a pencil or a brush in your hand. You're always a student. Yep. And that's always, my, always. Yeah. It, they should call it a practice, too, just like they do doctors. Uh, that that always got me. I thought, you you got your degree. You've been doing this for a while. Don't practice on me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still a practice every day. I still practice. Jess, you know, you're, you're doing so many different things. Uh, painting so many different works of art it always seems like you got a brush in your hand you're working on something I, i'm following your posts on instagram what's next for you what's exciting you what's inspiring you right now are you working on a series currently um i right now i'm doing a, a commission painting i've got a an old man down the road here that he is 97 years old and wow. um his wife died here a year and a half ago a month before their 70th anniversary and he was so lonesome, so he come down here to me, and dogs are therapy. You know that. Mm -hmm. And so my dog is his therapy. So every once in a while, I loan him my dog for three days. He gets down the dumps. Scruffy goes over there and stays with, with Scotty. And he's getting to the point, he's, now he's moved in with his daughter. But he has a place out here that is only a couple miles from me that has a beautiful outside scenery and everything. And... Uh, he calls it the million dollar view. So it's getting to the point where they're, he's, his driving isn't so good anymore. He comes out and sits in a chair to look at his million dollar view. So I'm painting it for him right now. Oh, wow. So, so that's, that's, he's gonna love that. Beautiful. He's gonna love that. Uh, but other than that, um, I, I love to do wildlife. I love the hands-on of the wildlife. We've worked with wildlife sanctuaries a lot. Um, I've had, I've had mountain lions laying on my lap. I've hugged a 2,500 pound rhino around the neck. Um, I've had hands on with so many animals. I red pandas up in my arms, you know, I've had cheetahs walking between my legs. I mean, we've had lots of experience with animals. I love that. I've never seen too many animals. I couldn't make a friend with. I've never seen a dog. I couldn't make a friend with ever. Yeah. Um, so working with the sanctuaries, it really drives me to paint more wildlife. Yeah. When I go out on photographic trips, which I do quite regular, that's the thing I'm looking for the most. I'm looking for wildlife or I'm looking for settings that I can put wildlife in. You, know? <laughs> you and me both know, you take a picture of every leaf, every blade of grass, you know, all the, cause you want to later on know what that grass looked like whenever you're putting some of it in here. hundred percent, my man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've got a so, little behind my screen here. I've got a little uh, pages that I've torn out of my sketchbook that I put on there for inspiration. And there's a scene uh, that I saw up in, in Grand Tetons, um, you know, Wyoming. And I've got an elk coming out in the mid morning in the, in, the, in, the, in the morning mist. And he's bugling out on this little creek. And it's been sitting there for five years. 
just there on the on the pinup board. Um, not well, I haven't been here five, but every time mm-hmm. I put up a pinup board in the studio, that that drawing goes out, thinking one day I'm going to get to it. But I took the reference of the rocks, the leaves, the gl- the grass, the yeah. trees, and this, yeah. and, and I yeah. never saw this, but I imagine wouldn't it be great if an elk just walked out here right now and just went, Whoa, you know? <laughs> yeah. But the one of the problems I run into is. We like to travel around a lot. We like to take road trips. Uh, you go into places like Utah, which is just the most amazing, completely different, one-of-a-kind place in the world. All these red rocks and stuff, you know, and these circles. It looks like big donuts out there in the middle. I mean, just incredible stuff. I take thousands of pictures every time I go there. But the thing about it is if I painted those, I got no place to sell them. Nobody here wants to buy a picture of that. Yeah. Yeah. You are stuck for your area it's like kind of like um, uh, African wildlife. Mm. Nobody here wants in their gallery. They don't even want it in the gallery. Really? Uh, it doesn't sell. You got to find some place that's got Africa stuff. Yeah. You got to. It's got to be. Uh, if, if I do uh, a lot of my wildlife, I send it to Alaska. Bang! It's gone right now. You know, you sell that stuff right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the Cowboys, Santa Fe, Arizona. You know, those kind of places. Texas, uh, but. How do you get all those paintings down there? You got to ship all that stuff, or you got to drive them all down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's a real problem with that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I have, I bet you I have 150,000 pictures on my computer that I've taken that are every one of them could be a painting or yeah. a part of a painting, sure. you know. And it, I go on those trips that fires me up like crazy to paint. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love to paint seascapes as you do. I go over to the coast here, which is only an hour drive away, and I can't shoot enough pictures of the ocean, even though you never take that that picture, you know, that's going to be that painting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but I can sit there for a day and just look at the water, just study out how this does that. I told my, I taught seascape painting for about six years in one of my classes, just nothing but that. And I told them all, the only way you're going to learn how to paint seascapes is to sit over there and understand why that wave is doing this, why that shadow is in there, why those foam patterns look like that, why that water, you got to go, you have to understand your subject before you can paint it. It's not just, you got a black spot on there, you're going to put a black spot on here. It doesn't work that way. Oh man, every time I go to paint a seascape, I am just learning something new and learning all over again. I have no idea what's going on there. You know, and every time I'm looking at a wave, I'm like, wow. Do you see that? Okay, <laughs> you know it's that last seascape you painted is just killer. I mean, that is just killer. That new tutorial you're just now coming out with. Oh, thanks, man. That is what. Oh man, I'd hang that in my house so fast. Thanks. I, I watched. The, I watched the YouTube part of that. I need to watch that whole thing. I think that is so awesomely done. I'm I telling you, it. I have. I have a guy here on the coast. His name is Byron Pickering. Which I oh, consider yeah, him Byron. To, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I he, we've been friends. We painted together for forty some years. You know, right? Um, I I thought he was the best seascape painter I'd ever been around in my life. He quit painting about twenty some years ago. Never painted again. Never painted again. Oh. Nothing. I push him all the time. He just doesn't paint. Doesn't have any drive anymore inside. Oh man. Uh, but now, you have a seascape that I absolutely fell in love with. Well, and I'm about biggest... to go I'm about to go live with this one just now after we hang up the call. I'm doing the live stream from the studio working on the big seascape. So that's that's been on there for several weeks now, but we're getting there. The one thing the one thing that's really odd now with seascapes is that our water here in Oregon hmm. and your water there totally different. Oh, yeah. Our water on the East Coast Totally different. Totally in different. fact, I painted I painted some stuff uh, for the East Coast, sent it out there, and they said, this is West Coast water, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Just like that. I did. I thought the ocean was the ocean. No. You go out there, and it's not. You know, currents, it's not. currents temperature, oxygen level, algae, uh, and, and then light angle on top of it. You know, you've got light a sunrise angle. versus sunset. And, and so the ocean in Western Australia, in particular in an al- area called Albany, and even an area called Esperance, it is fluorescent. There's, there's no way to describe it. It's a neon wave, and you've never seen anything like it. I've never, ever come across anything like it. And so when I paint it, people are like, that looks kind of hokey. I'm like, dude, I toned it down. Like, it, it is really, it's something else. Yeah. yeah. It was incredible when we drove the, 
Well, we put 3,000 miles on our car when we were over there, yeah. and it was on the coastline almost the whole way. That ocean is just beautiful, mm -hmm. and it's almost like a tropical color. You know, yeah. that turquoise yeah. is just so incredible. We don't have anything like that here. There's no ever, you'll never, ever see that color here. Man, yeah. Ever, ever. <laughs> yeah, it's so your your, demogra your demographics make a difference on what you paint also. Absolutely. Uh, John, Like John Colgan, where he lives down there, uh, I, I stay in touch with John. He paints those most beautiful uh, Grand Canyon things, you know, but that's where he lives. Mm. So that's easy to sell down there. If he was to paint my uh, Western trees and cricks and stuff up here, he probably couldn't give it away down there. Demographics makes a difference. So that's the other thing the artists need to do is they need to go down to what their area is going to look, unless they're going to be painting in that other area, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm. It makes Man, it a little tougher this way. I, I could talk to you all day, Jess. This is great. I, I'm going to direct people um, to, to your website and your Instagram. And again, just encourage them to follow you there and check out your amazing work. Uh, Jess, you're a hell of a guy, man, and, and a real inspiration. <laughs> Pleasure to, to, to call you friend. It really is. You inspire me hugely, and I just want to say thank you so much for spending this time with me today, and, and thank you so much for being on the, uh, the Creative Endeavor. Uh, you'll be my buddy the rest of my life. I'll tell you right now. Awesome, my friend. We'll see you again. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor Podcast. And a huge thank you to Jess Anderson for joining me. Now, as always, you can find out more information about the artists that I interview on this podcast by clicking those links in the description down below. Jess can be found on Instagram. Make sure you go and follow him over there. Simply go to Jess underscore Anderson underscore artist. And he also has a fantastic website showcasing his incredible artwork. Go to JessAnderson.com. Thank you so much for stopping by. Make sure you click that like button if you enjoyed this episode and leave me a comment down below. I've got more episodes of the Creative Endeavor podcast coming your way, so make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you're notified when I upload another episode. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook and my website, andrewtischler.com. I really look forward to hanging out with you once again in another episode of the Creative Endeavor. So long.